you know, did you, did you see yourself in a leadership role right from when you were a, a young guy? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, um, you know, I always, um, just had a mindset of, um, my, you know, not that I necessarily knew it at the time, but even when I was younger, I very much was a, a servant leader hmm. um, in the sense that, you know, I, I always really looked, I looked out for the friend group that we had, you know, we all grew up, none of us had fathers, we grew up in a, you know, government subsidized apartment complex in Southeast Dallas, and that was our normal. So it wasn't like, you know, we, we recognize any hardship that was just our normal. Uh, but I always, you know, operated from the uh, perspective of, you know, a servant uh, leader in the sense that I, I did want to provide vision and I, I did want to um, help and uplift and uh, always came to the situation from a positive uh, perspective, you know, kind of like an attitude of abundance. Not that I necessarily identified with any of these things at the time. This is all retrospectively looking back on my experiences and what shaped me as a child. But I, I, I was definitely that kid that said, you know, if I've got five bucks in my pocket and my other four or five buddies had nothing, well, we just, we weren't going to do anything. I, w I wasn't going to be the only guy that, you know, walked down to the McDonald's and bought something for myself. And, you know, so we all, you know, I just always approached it from the standpoint of we're going to just all cl climb this mountain together. And um, I didn't want to have anything if, if, if the other guys couldn't have an opportunity to have the same. And uh, looking back, it, it really has helped, you know, instill in me this idea of servant leadership yeah that's great i have to ask you were you an athlete as a young as a young man yeah yeah i played all sports okay. uh, until i got to uh, junior high and then junior high really just played basketball and um football organized and then in uh, high school i uh, just organized uh football and um but i've always loved to play basketball really any sport i love to play yeah Do you do you bring that sort of mentality to Berkshire Hathaway in terms of just that sports mentality team? It's, it sounds like I love your attitude. It's much, very much like sports. That's where I come from. And I feel like that's what helps teams win when you, you're worried about the guy next to you in a positive yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I try to bring as much of my athletic background into my role uh, here within the company as I can. And, um, at the same time, I, I, I'm also very mi mindful and intentional about the idea that not everyone played sports and, and some people, um, you know, referencing too much of, uh, you know, athletic metaphors and analogies can turn some people off. So I just try to be balanced with it, but it certainly is um, a big part of who I am. And so I can't ignore it. <laughs> I just yeah. try to be mindful about, you know, seeking a balance. Yeah. So... I talk a lot with CEOs about taking the time to invest in their, their people as, um, you know, as individuals and not just addressing them as the team. I'm wondering just, you know, for you, do you spend time with the individuals on your team? Like in, you know, private meetings or taking them to lunch, doing things like that, where you can really get to know them at a deeper level, or is it pretty much you're just addressing the team? Some CEOs just like to address the team and they don't spend a lot of time with these one-on-one -on -one exchanges. I'm just wondering uh, how you go about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm much more uh, into, um, you know, the depth, the quality over quantity. You know, I, I feel like, you know, a key part of my role as the CEO, and again, it goes back to some of these childhood memories and, and, and lessons that shape who I am as a person is, I wanna really help develop people. Mm. And, you know, I really, I take an active and intentional and deliberate role in developing myself really so that I can help develop other people. And, um, and I think the only way that you can do that is to spend real quality, you know, intimate time with people one-on-one -on -one or in small group settings to understand, you know, what is it about their backgrounds? What are their motivations? What are their inspirations? What motivates them outside of work? And, um, and, you know, what, what really tunes them up professionally about what they're trying to achieve um, so that I can, you know, just, just be a, a source of inspiration and guidance and, and, and or just counsel um, along the way. And so, you know, the challenge with that in, in my current role is I don't, 
physically sit with in the same office day in and day out with the majority of my staff. I travel quite a bit. I've got uh, about 50% of my staff is remote. They work in the field. Uh, the other, uh, you know, site-based members of our staff work between two locations. So, you know, you, you just, I just try to be very mindful about, you know, making phone calls, sending notes, leveraging text messaging, um, you know, doing all the things that I can, I can do to stay physically um, and, and emotionally connected to them, given the fact that I'm not with them physically, you know, five days a week, eight hours a day. Yeah, no, that's great. I love that, man. I love that. How, how are you dealing with the COVID and everything else, you know, and keeping your people engaged and excited and, and positive? You know, I know a lot of people are feeling quite lonely right now. Uh, that's what I'm, what I'm he hearing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, the one thing uh, that, that I did right when this um, happened, so second week of March, you know, before the, the shutdowns were uh, mandated, uh, we went to a, we completely virtualized our operation just in anticipation of what was going to happen. And that was that Friday, March 14th or whatever that, that was. And uh, so be, because we were on our toes about what was happening and, and got to consequently control the, the timing of this and the, and the communication and the operationalization of it, um, I was able to say, okay, I want every single department to have at least one daily meeting, virtual meeting like we're doing here, at least one, and most of the departments gravitated towards two, one in the morning, one in the evening. Um, and then um, what I did was I got in front of the organization like this on an every week basis with the leadership team, and then I was doing uh, videos for our whole global network. And in the beginning, I was doing as many as three uh, videos that I was able to take time and thought and write out my messaging, video it, edit it down a little bit and send it out to the network. And then in addition to that, uh, doing panels where I was bringing staff members or network members into a group setting on like a Zoom as an example, and doing that on a live basis. And then, you know, having that accessible through my Facebook and other social feeds that, that it would be viewable on demand for those that didn't participate live really has allowed us to establish, you know, a, a frequency and a cadence of, you know, just sharing, uh, just, you know, letting everyone know that, hey, we're still connected, even though we're apart. And, and uh, really, what that did was that encouraged our companies, our staff, our network members, and the network members doing this within their client base to basically follow suit. So it's really created this, you know, this whole you know, sort of ecosystem within our whole global network where we're, we're really, really more connected now because of, you know, out of necessity than we were before in the sense of sharing and, and creating content. Obviously, being apart physically has had its, you know, challenges. And I, I think, you know, we're, we're doing the best to, to make, uh, you know, to make the best out of the situation. Um, but I, but, you know, those are some of the things that we've done. But I, I you know, nothing, nothing beats being together physically. So I'm looking forward to that, you know, day returning at some point in the future. Yeah. I think, I think we all, uh, in some ways, what, you know, I love talking actually about the challenges. What, what are some of the challenges that, that you're facing on a day-to-day -day basis? Cause I think people, they relate to challenges, you know, they want to make yeah. sure alone. Yeah. Well, you know, so much of, you know, so much of what we do is, is a, physical, personal, relational business, right? So in my role for Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, we are a global network of about 53,000 real estate professionals across North America, Western Europe, Dubai. And, you know, a lot of, you know, so when I, everything that I do, I try to put myself in the shoes of the real estate professionals that are out serving their communities and serving their clients. And that's a very physical, relational, you know, kind of dynamic. And so a lot of, a lot of what we do is focused on inspiration and motivation and instruction and sharing information and best practices and various, you know, items of content. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's not the same to do it in a completely virtual world. Yeah. So not being able to be out in the community, being out with the agents, particularly giving a lot of a lot of the societal unrest that we're dealing with right now. 
you know, I think it is a challenge to just, just to just assume that I can be as impactful and influential as I want to be in a completely virtual world operating from my home office. So I think that is the biggest challenge um, that that we have right now. Um, you know, the other the other big challenge just in terms of our industry is the real estate market is is hot. It's as hot as it's been since pre uh, Great Recession. And so, you know, to to work through all of the nuance, given the safety concerns and the the restrictions, and now the the, the resurgence of the of the you know pandemic, uh, the the COVID nineteen, you know, just trying to navigate all of the the complexities that that brings on in a in a hot you know a white hot marketplace is also challenging as well. And so, you know, just doing our, the best we can to you know manage through all of that. Yeah. So I'm guessing that the, the videos and all the uh, different sort of chats keep everybody pretty, at least focused on forward, as opposed to, you know, just what I say, like bathing in what's going on around us, the negatives. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that, that's what it's really intended to do is, is you know, just, I, I want our people to be mindful of their role as, as leaders within their own communities. Hmm. You know, real estate professionals uh, by nature are, um, you know, they, they, they should be very strategic, they should be advisory, they should be um, a light, you know, for their community. And you, you can't be all of those things if you're, like you say, marinating in the negativity. And it's not that we want to ignore it, we've got to be mindful of it, but we can't, you know, we, we can't just be, you know, sucked up into it and watching the news and, and all of that every day, because those, you know, those, those people the news I'm, I'm referring to, they have an agenda too, right? And they want to keep us tuned into the negativity because that's how they generate their dollars, you know? So. Oh yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you on that. I, I wanted to ask you too. So Berkshire Hathaway, what makes, what makes your brand in the real estate space unique relative to some of the other brands that are out there? What's, what's the differentiator would you say? Well, yeah, I think, you know, the, the biggest thing for me is that, you know, we are, um, we are inextricably linked to the iconic and uh, completely unmatched um, prestige and distinction of our parent company, Berkshire Hathaway. There's no other real estate brand in the world that has an association with a name like Berkshire Hathaway, which is perennially ranked as the, one of the top five most respected companies, most trusted companies, most valued companies. You look at Fortune, you look at Forbes, you look at you know, any of the big rankings, we're right up there with Apple and Google and Starbucks and Wells Fargo. And so that, that is an imprimatur, right? It, it means that as a real estate agent, you're attached to something that's much, much greater than yourself, which means that you've got to operate with, with the, the core values that we, that we operate under trust, res, respect, integrity, longevity, stability, and when you operate with an imprimatur like Berkshire Hathaway, it means that you've got to put yourself behind the needs of your clients. And, you know, most people don't recognize that, you know, sometimes when consumer transactions go the wrong way, Mr. Buffett's office directly gets a call or a letter. Mm -hmm. So that you're, you're operating with a whole different echelon of, of expectation than all of the other real estate brands. And so that expectation comes with a premium. And if you look specifically at some of our, um, you know, deliverables, as an example, you know, one of the media metrics that we follow very closely is what's called share of voice. It's basically an indication of how your brand performs in your respective industry against your peers. And in the media space, Berkshire Hathaway Home Services and the halo effect we get from Mr. Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway, we command 77% of the media's share of voice in the whole industry. The next closest competitor has only 7%. So we're 11 times more amplified as a brand in the marketplace. So when you combine the halo effect, some of the institutional affinity that we get as a result of our affiliation with Berkshire Hathaway, and then the specific deliverables that we create in terms of communication and marketing and advertising, it's a pretty unprecedented collection of, of offerings that we have. Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing too that allows you to attract better talent. Yeah, attract better talent, um, you know, but, you know, in this industry, 
you know, that because of the independent contractor relationship, sometimes that talent gets a little too big for its britches, so to speak. And so you got to be willing to part ways, right? Yeah. You got to be, be willing. Our, our operators have to be willing to part ways with the wrong people and stand up for what's right, honor the customer and, um, and do the right things all the time. Yeah, that, that's a good segue because I wanted to ask you about that. I work with a lot of folks that they have a, a high performer. He or she is doing really well and, you know, bringing some, some good money to the table, but they're not a great fit in terms of team and culture. How do, how do you handle that? Well, you know, I mean, to the extent that that person, and so, so here's what I would say is what we're always looking for, whether it's attracting companies into our network or agents or teams or businesses into our, into our network is we're looking for people that are coachable, willing to grow and in alignment with our values. And our values are very clear, trust, integrity, stability, longevity, very, very clear. And if, if they're not coachable, which means they're unwilling to learn from their mistakes or have someone else, you know, contribute to their seeing whatever they've done is, isn't, isn't appropriate and willing to change, then you got to part ways. Yeah. Nothing, you know, Mr. Buffett says it takes you 50 years to establish a great reputation in five minutes to destroy it. And the reality is if people look at their career or whatever they're doing, through the lens of a, you know, a tactical objective, like I'm just short term, I'm about this deal, I'm about this dollar at the expense of the next 10 deals or the next 20 deals, then it's just, it's a, it's a wrong mindset. It's a wrong fit. And you got to be willing to part ways. And that's why, you know, one of the fundamental things that we're focused on in terms of leadership coaching is to operate from the law of abundance, as opposed to the law of scarcity. If you operate from the law of scarcity, your willingness to part ways with that person is going to be much different than if you operate from the law of abundance. I operate from the law of abundance. I know that even despite our size as the brokerage organization that, that we're a part of, we're the number one real estate company in the United States. And, um, and as a real estate uh, brand, even though we're only six and a half years old, Berkshire Home Services as a franchise brand, we're already the fourth largest real estate franchise brand in the world. And so, I, I look at our upside is, is limitless. So if I operate from a law of abundance, not from scarcity, that means if I need to part ways with a company or an office or a team or an agent, that's okay with me because I know that there's a lot more upside. And quite frankly, a lot of people don't consider that that one bad apple that you're keeping is probably inhibiting you from attracting three or four great superstars um, in, in, into your organization. So I, I look at it from, from all of those different perspectives. Got it. So I, when you say the law of abundance, how do you train yourself to maintain that abundance mindset uh, within yourself, even when things may not be going well? Because I could see that being difficult for people. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I, I think it's just a, you know, I think it's a, it's a big question. It's a great question. I, I think it's, it's a function of a lot of different things that I think you need to be doing all the time. First of all, you need to be growing all the time. You know, I think that people that operate from scarcity mentalities, there's almost an invisible lid that they put on themselves, right? And, and John Maxwell and his 21 irrefutable laws of leadership, one of the laws is the law of the lid. And if you, if you, don't, rec if you don't recognize or if you do, there's a lid. And if you, if you focus on that lid, then it basically says, well, I'm at the peak of my performance. That means that I don't have the opportunity to grow. That means I need to really hoard and kind of keep everything with me, right? And that's a scarcity mentality. Whereas you operate from a, from a standpoint of I'm constantly growing, I'm constantly learning, I'm constantly pushing myself and people around me to grow and learn, and I'm surrounded by people like that, then you recognize that, man, what I learned uh, you know, in the last month is more powerful than what I learned in the whole year five years ago, right? You're accelerating your capacity to grow and expand. And, and so when you do some of these things collectively and, 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 and consistently, you start to recognize that, man, I'm going to be more powerful next year than I was in all four of the previous years put together because I'm just growing so rapidly. 
And But again, if you're not surrounding yourself with people that think that way, if they don't operate from the same standpoint, if you're not constantly growing and operating in a spirit of continuous improvement, you're not going to have those broad horizons, right? You're going to have horizons that say, I'm limited, I'm boxed in, the market is only so big, my opportunity is defined as A, B, and C, you're not even thinking about opportunities D, E, and F, and so that's where that scarcity mentality comes in, and I see that with a lot of people, you know, they, they operate from scarcity because they have a very limited perspective on what they can achieve, and that's primarily a function of how, how big they're thinking and the people they're surrounding themselves with. Hmm. Do you find that to be common amongst maybe some young realtors that are just starting out that maybe haven't made their first sale or two yet where they may they question whether they could do it or not? Have you seen any of that? Yeah, I, I find it not necessarily even amongst the, the younger or newer uh, agents uh, because a lot of people pursue real estate as a second career option. Um, I see it across the board, really. You know, I, I feel like actually sometimes the more established person, the more established business owner might, might be stuck in a rut mm. and say, man, I, you know, I've, I, I got here by doing X, Y, and Z. And man, it's becoming harder and harder and harder to do X, Y, Z, as opposed to just stepping back and saying, well, geez, what's everyone else doing? How big is the canvas? What can I take from other people and how am I pushing myself to get outside of this X, Y, Z swim lane? Um, and so I, I would say probably in response to your question, I, I tend to see it more among mid-level and, and, and more established uh, types of, of owners and, and operators. Got it. Okay. So you, you took, we've spoken a lot already about development, but I want to dig in a little bit about your development as, as a person and as a leader. It sounds like you have a passion for it. Well, what are, what are some of the things that you've identified within yourself throughout the years that maybe have limited you a little bit and that things that you've overcome in order to become who you are right now? Yeah, I think, um, you know, probably, uh, you know, looking back, taking, taking more and bigger risks, you know, along the way, um, you know, I, I, I could definitely see having having made bigger risks earlier on in my career um you know would have would would have or could have potentially put me on a different trajectory um i think also um with some of the ventures that i that i did pursue and do you know having a more buttoned up understanding of you know you know what specifically do I, do I want to leverage this opportunity to create, you know, having a little bit more intentional or deliberate mindset of, Hey, this is a, you know, this is a step in this direction or a progression, or this is a venture that I'm going to go do because this is going to lead to something else. I think I was in the first part of my career, much more just, um, uh, opportunistic, you know, just like, kind of like, Hey, just, you know, uh, you know, more, just not deliberate, not intentional enough about what I wanted to establish. I should have, I could have been much more, um, you know, like focused on, you know, specific goals and specific accountabilities uh, to achieve those goals. And, um, you know, I, I th those are some of the initial things that come to mind. Yeah. Is that something you do now? You set more goals and, and live with more intent? Yeah. And I have, you know, I've done that, you know, I'd say for the last, you know, you know, 10 to 15 years, whereas the first 10 or so years, uh, probably not enough. Yeah. And those, you know, looking back, those are probably some of those, you know, some of those important years where, you know, you don't have the family, you don't have the older kids, you don't have so much rooted in, you know, in what you're doing that prevents you from taking some of those risks, right? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So your your day to I love to talk about day to day routines. I feel like your routines day to day make you who you are. Yeah. For you, how do you go about your day managing? You know everything from from leading a, a great company to managing your own self, health, mindset, physicality, mentality, all that, family. Like how how do you do it? How do you package it all? Yeah. So, you know the the first thing for me is is just to be uh, very mindful about you know how I'm feeling. And um, 
I, I'm very, very um, focused on my sleep. I, I have to get eight hours of sleep. There's been a lot of books and studies written on that. I think a lot of people kid themselves that they don't need eight hours of sleep. It's a, it's a hoax. It's fake news. You need to get great sleep. And so it all starts with me there. And then, um, you know, throughout my life, I've been more or less turned on or turned off of, you know, a focus on my own physical fitness. Um, and that really just kind of ebbs and flows with my travel and with, you know, my family schedule and things like that. But I, I try to be very, very mindful about that and, and have been really, really good and disciplined and on a great routine uh, really for about the last six or seven months. Prior to that, not so much a routine, but mindful of it. Um, and so definitely start in the morning at the same time. Um, I pretty much have the same routine in the morning in terms of how I spend my time in reflection and a little bit of meditation and in preparing for the day. I am always um, deliberate about scheduling into my schedule time to work out. And it's really an ebb and flow on my, on my meeting responsibilities. Could be in the morning. It's been lately, basically mid-afternoon. Most of the times, never in the evenings because that's uh, kind of family time and, and just kind of unwinding time. And if I work out in the late, later part of the e afternoon or early evening, then it impacts my sleep. So I'm really trying to focus on sleep, early morning routine around meditation and, 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 and uh, focus on my schedule and being deliberate about scheduling time in my, in my day for uh, working out. And then outside of that, I never make a commitment of my time without consulting my schedule. My schedule is everything. So I operate from a list. I never am, uh, I'm never an arm's length away from my to-do list. And I usually have a little scratch pad that I, that I take around and they, these two things stay together. I'm never away from my list and I never make a commitment of my time without consulting my schedule. So in my schedule, literally I've got things down to the tasks that I need. I time block to return calls. I time block to check email. I time block to, um, you know, do certain other types of activities like wishing people a birthday or making social media posts and things like that. And that really, for me, allows me to tactically get through, you know, the, the day's activities and, and what I need to do. And then strategically, I operate from uh, very much a plan. So my you know, years and my quarters uh, are very much operated from a, from a plan. And then I know that on a weekly basis, I've got all the right accountability structures in place with myself and my own accountability partners, plus our staff and my direct staff, my leadership team and their, and their departments. So it, it works pretty good that we've got a good, you know, a good cadence and a good understanding of who's doing what and how we're getting where we want to go. Yeah, I love it. You sound more like a head coach. I love it. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely, you know, I always say if I, if I wasn't doing this, I'd be coaching. I'd absolutely be coaching football somewhere for sure. Yeah, I'm guessing they're, they're, they're similar in many ways. Yeah, yeah, but absolutely. Bringing that team together, pushing good habits forward, getting people to work together, play nice together, and yep. really center around of, of, of winning, you know? How do we win as a yep. couple? Yeah, yep, exactly. When, when did you start taking your, uh, let's say, your health and your, your wellness and all of this strategy more serious? Or what, was it something you always did? You know, I always did it. I just, um, you know, I've just allowed myself to make excuses uh, sometimes along the way. You know, sometimes I just get more into it than other times. I mean, a big, a big you know, uh, I guess, you know, lie I tell myself or excuse I, I allow myself to get behind is when I'm on the road, it's, and I travel, you know, some anywhere two to four days a week. Okay. And it's, it, it's just easy to just make yourself believe that it's hard. And, and I, and I fall into that trap and, you know, I would go in and out and, you know, I, like you as you're a world-class athlete, you know, your, your ability to kind of tune into your body and what's going on is, is pretty, pretty dialed in. And um, not that I, you know, have, have been a, I'm not a world-class athlete, but I, but I, ha I do have an, an awareness about yeah. how my body is responding. And that, that has typically been kind of my calibration point. So it's like, ah, oh, man, I just feel like crap. I'm not sleeping well and I don't have the energy. Okay. I know I need to get kind of back into it and I get back into it. And then the travel routine kind of kicks in and I allow myself to make excuses and I fall out of it. 
And so that's kind of how it's been for, I don't know, it feels like, you know, the last six to 10 years. And, and then um, really at the end of last year, I said, okay, that's it. No more, no more lying to yourself, big guy. You got to figure it out. And so that's why I say for the last six months, I've been very, very mindful, allow myself to, you know, push all the excuses and self lies and self talk aside and uh, gotten back in, you know, into it and, and feel really good. Feel the best I felt right now based on the last six months uh, regimen, um, you know, in the last 15 years. And so now it's just one of those things I got to be mindful of. I got to put, you know, this uh, forward in, in my thinking and my, my reflection daily. I've got to be accountable to my accountability partners about this and uh, just maintain it and not let myself, you know, fall back into some old bad habits. Yeah. When, and, you know, you mentioned meditation you do as well. Is that something you do with consistency or is it, you know, as needed? Uh, I try to be consistent about it, even if it's just a peaceful, you know, five minutes of, of conscious breathing with the, with the eye, you know, the, I, the watch, Apple watch, whatever it is, um, you know, that the app calm, yeah. um, I've, I've, I've got that. And so I'll, I'll fire that up. But, you know, the, the key there is I get up um, first in the, in the house and my wake up time varies anywhere from five to 6 a.m. It just kind of, kind of varies. A lot of times I'll hop up even before the alarm goes off. And so the key to me though, is as long as I can be in a quiet space, which typically if I'm up at between five and six, no, no one else in the family's up, including our lazy dog. And so I can be very, uh, I can be very uh, consistent with that. And uh, like I said, even if it's just a five minute peaceful, peaceful, relaxing time breathing, um, that's, that's kind of checks the box. Yeah, would you, I, I'm guessing too, all of this helps you manage just the natural day to day stress and potential anxiety of, of being a CEO for a, you know, a big company that's, you know, that's on the board, that's on the big board. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's all, it's all part and parcel. And, you know, when I, when I talk to people that, you know, are, are challenged with, you know, with something, usually whatever they're challenged with is, um, is a symptom of, you know, of the root situation, right? And that root situation is, I'm not getting enough sleep. I'm not being mindful. I'm not taking some time to be reflective about my thoughts. I'm putting too much negativity into my, into my psychology. I'm watching the news too much, et cetera. And so, yeah, for me, it's trying to kind of cover all of these root bases so that I don't let, you know, the symptoms become worse than the disease, right? Because the disease is not taking care of ourselves mentally and physically and spiritually. And, um, you know, so, so people will come to me and, you know, it's their, you know, I'm, my budget's off, my income's off, my finances off, my relationships off, my business is off. Well, let's trace that back to a root cause. The root cause is I'm just not sleeping enough. Why aren't you sleeping enough? I'm drinking too much. Okay. So let's, let's talk about, right. These key things, these are keystone habits that create small wins. And uh, I think people, you know, they underestimate they overestimate what they can achieve in a day and underestimate what they can achieve in a week. And a lot of times it, 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 that's the same mentality of habits. It's I'm not achieving the bigger things, but it's because you're ignoring the little things, yeah. you know? And so you just try to just, just try to be mindful. I try to be mindful of that myself. And, and um, you're right. Is, is these little things help, help manage the big things. Yeah. I find too, you know, in today's culture, there are people that are very growth uh, oriented, but they also become growth obsessed and they don't know when to stop. So it's like their day, they just keep taking on more and more and their week, they take on more and more and their weeks become continuous and they don't, they don't ever have separation into that. Like you were saying earlier, your personal life where you spend time with your family, um, taking care of yourself from a health standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing, man. I mean, if we're not, if we're not going to be alive, Right, or if we're going to be stressed out all day, we're going to have a short temper with people. Um, then what? What good are any of your goals if you're going to operate from that mindset? I mean, you're not you're not going to achieve very much, right? Yep. What What would you say? What's your favorite part about being a CEO? Just the ability to impact other people. You know, I just really, um, you know, I just value when when people respond back or or share you know, what they've taken away from a, you know, a speech I've given or um, that they, you know, write me a handwritten note because I wrote them a handwritten note, you know, or, 
that you know I've I've had some kind of an impact on them positively is my most rewarding um, thing. And I and I really also, you know, I believe that you know people people want to be led, and people people value leadership, and I value leadership. I want to be led, and I'm a leader, and I'm sure you feel the same way. And so. I just value the opportunity to share, you know, my perspectives and my experiences um, as a leader and, and to lead, you know, and, and to and to infuse people with a feeling, with an emotion, whether that's, you know, um, you know, whatever it is, whether whether it's positive, whether it's encouraging, whether it motivates them, whether it inspires them, you know, to have that opportunity, I think, is very powerful, and and I appreciate and and try to honor that. Yeah, that's great, man. Yeah, everybody needs a good leader in their life. Yeah. I would say yeah. it's too hard to do it alone. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I just, you know, I, I feel sorry for, you know, I, you know, some people that, that don't. I feel like, you know, there's, there's a certain style of, of person where they're too afraid to ask for help because they don't want to admit that they don't know what to do and, or they don't want to share the credit in the outcome. Mm. And um, I really feel, you know, I feel for that, that mindset that people may, may have from time to time. It's like, Hey man, reach out. Cause there's a lot of people, you know, very few people that I know that have, ex have really achieved and, and, and succeeded in life aren't willing to share with you. And most of the most successful people are willing to share completely transparently. And so there, there's so much of that opportunity in the world. And for people that, that aren't embracing it, it's just a missed opportunity. Yeah. Listen, I, I tell you, that's, that's what we're doing right now. I appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your story and somebody out there, like I'm, I'm, I'm running this live right now. Somebody is going to take something away. So it's, it's leadership at its finest. We're, we're giving great lessons to people to help them, along their day-to-day -day journey. And I, I have one, one final question for you. I ask this at, at the end of every show. I call this the Becoming a Champion show. I feel like we're all on a journey to become our, our champion self, whether, I don't know if we ever get there because we keep pushing the chains down the field, but what, what does the word champion mean to you? Oh man, that's a, uh, that's a great question. You know, um, you know, I, I don't know, I don't, you know, I, I don't know that you can, I don't know that you can really identify the word champion in the absence of the word sacrifice. Mm. And I think that, you know, people, uh, particularly, you know, and in, in, in I feel like in today's world where, you know, we, we, we just want to get to the end so fast. You know, and so people lack the patience, they lack the appreciation of the journey, as opposed to the finality of the destination. And I think that that's something that's that's missing um, in, in what we're doing in a lot of ways, professionally and societally is, man, you, you got to appreciate that sacrifice and appreciate the learning and appreciate the collaboration and, and appreciate those things that um, are going to put you at the very, very, very top and not be burdened by them, like not be labored by the idea that it's going to take you time to get where you want to go. And um, it's going to it's going to take you some loss and sacrifice and 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 things that are going to come up that you didn't anticipate. And and all of that setback and that and those obstacles, that's part of it like that. Those all of those experiences go into that word champion. And people look at those things as, as, as not a part of it. They, they, they only want to identify the successes or the wins or the milestones. And that's not it. As a matter of fact, the more of those challenges and obstacles that you can uncover and discover and recover from will accelerate that path to a championship status. And so, you know, I feel like sacrifice is one big thing. And I think the other thing is, uh, the word genuine. Mm. You know, I feel like there's this whole other, you know, phenomenon going on out there where we're so quick to identify with 
what we see as success or what we see or identify in as championship, um, you know, pedigree. And if those things aren't you, then, then you're just wasting your time. You know, people try to be other people or try to replicate other people's success, or they see, you know, a model of success embodied in a certain business model or a certain approach. And if those things don't speak to your true authentic self and that you can't be genuine, you're just wasting your time and you're, you're chasing things that are probably never going to materialize for you un, as opposed to saying, this is what I'm going to genuinely, genuinely focus on. This is my true authentic self. And I'm going to pour, pour myself into becoming the best version of that genuine version of myself as I can. That is the fastest path to your championship status. And so I, I think Dana, those would be two things, sacrifice and, and uh, being genuine. Yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> that's been the best definition yet. Uh, oh, that's great. That's awesome to hear.